Man, thank you for praying, for singing as we worship together. Now let's open the word together. Philippians chapter 1, as we continue through this study carefully uh, through the book of Philippians. This morning we're going to focus in on three verses. Philippians 1, verses 3, 4, and 5. So I encourage you along the way, open your Bibles, paper or digital. Let's read the word together. Have some space to take notes. We've got worship guides provided for you. You can fill in the outline there. There's, but there's more importantly, there's open space for you to write down thoughts. You may want to use your favorite notes app on your phone or our mobile app, whatever. Let's just be engaged together to open the word, to study and learn, because here's the truth. You're in this room in this room for a reason today. And God has not only has a word for you, but the challenge is that every one of us responds to God's word when it's presented. It demands a response. And I pray that you would begin now to consider, okay, Lord, what do you have for me? And let's explore what that is together. These are very exciting days at Calvary Baptist Church. I mean, God is doing so many amazing things, and we get the privilege to be a part of it. We're blessed, as our pastor emeritus would say for decades, blessed beyond measure. And God is pouring out blessings and favor on us, and we trust him every single day. And in fact, uh, if you didn't see it, do yourself a favor, go to the website, search the 2023 year-end conference, read that book of reports to see all the many ways God has blessed us. And one of the things that you'll also see there in that review is we're moving forward. Like we've got some very specific written goals for our church for 2024. Some of those are tangible, practical things like new carpet in this room. Some of those are more missional things like a very intentional effort to invite those in our neighborhoods and communities who have de-churched or who are unchurched and some very intentional strategic efforts to reach them that are going to drive what we do this year. Another one of those goals that you'll see listed there is an upgrade of the kind of infrastructure and the backbones of our audio video system. Why do I even tell you that? Uh, a, because it's old and it's archaic. It needs to be upgraded to a more fully digital system. It's going to be awesome. And a lot of that you won't even see. It'll be in wires under the floor. But more importantly, that was a specific goal of our beloved and belated worship pastor, Michael King. He had been working on it for years, researching what he wanted, what we needed to do, and telling us why. And we miss him dearly. And we're going to honor his goal, and we're going to get it done. And the beauty of it, too, like that's very expensive. And even the ability to do that has been made possible by the generosity of some of you who've made some very significant designated gifts to make that goal come true. It's pretty cool. So I share that today, one, because it's a goal that we're going to do, but the why behind it is even more important. Okay, to honor and remember well. But I'll be honest, for me personally, being a little transparent this morning, even stating that goal takes my brain back to some pretty, we were talking about this in staff meeting this last week, and I just broke down crying again. Like, because this is like a real hurt for me. Like, uh, I could be, I'm going to do it again today. Gosh, sorry, Matt. Uh, like, Michael's the closest friend I ever lost in my life. And so it's still hard. It's really hard. And so I reflect back on moments over this past year that uh, some cool moments in that, like, for example, we had like a, a legitimate group grief counseling session with all the church staff, and we asked Dr. Don Wilhite to come in. And uh, like we were really struggling, really grieving together. But the thing that made it possible was that we were doing it together. Like that's the thing that made it so beautiful. Um, and so when I reflect back on that, it, it causes me to like stir with joy. Like as difficult as that was, and it doesn't even come close to the difficulty 
of Matt and Debbie, his parents. But as the difficulty of that, how much more manageable and hopeful it was to not have to do that by yourself. Does that make sense? That you can do it in a community of genuine love, genuine support, genuine togetherness. And this is not just true of this incident. This is not just true of the church staff walking through this together. It's true of our church family. Like when we look across the room to each other, we don't just see faces. There are stories revealed where we together, like we've walked through some pretty hard stuff. We've grieved the loss of loved ones. We've, we've cared for one another during long illnesses or tragedy or difficult times in our home. We've supported one another through the hurdles of marriage or the struggle of parenting or navigating job loss or on and on and on we go. And I'm not going to ask you to look around literally the room, but if you did, you would see what I see from this perspective, how real that is. But that's where family counts. That's where we feel the reality of that. And I, I hope you are the same and can say the same thing. That when I reflect on that, I realize how blessed we are to be able to be a part of such a beautiful church family that isn't perfect, but genuinely loves and cares for each other. And that attitude lifts off of the page when we look at our text today. Let's read together Philippians 1, 3 through 5, and then I want to unpack and look at some comments through it. Paul is writing to the church at Philippi. If you missed this last week, the historical backstory, you can catch up that way online really easily. It reads this way. I thank my God in all remembrance of you, Always in every prayer of mine for you, always making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. If you'll allow me, I want to make a couple of observations today that the Lord has shown me in studying this text. We'll see if it, it applies to you. Here's the first thing. We see the attitude of gratitude. We specifically see it in verse 3 because Paul says, I thank God every time I remember and reflect on you. The attitude of gratitude. Attitudes are powerful and attitudes shape what we do. I, I've told many of you this story before. Uh, my parents growing up were, I would argue, too strict. That's okay. It, it, it worked. And so I wasn't allowed to have any decorations like no posters on my wall, no, no nothing. Okay, as much of a Michael Jordan fan as I was, yeah, you're not putting that poster on your wall. I had a picture of two ducks swimming in a pond that my mom picked out. Like, that's what's on my wall. That was it. As we got older, things lightened up a little bit. I'm, I'm talking about, you know, like elementary, even middle school age. And my dad posted a bumper sticker on the outside of my door, my brother and I shared a room, and we had to stare at that every time we opened our door. And it simply said this, Jesse, attitudes are contagious. Make sure yours is worth catching. And I had to stare at that every single day. And he was reinforcing in us at the earliest of days, like, hey, you need an attitude here that's positive. And when we were out of line, like spankings in our house weren't called discipline. They were called attitude adjustments. <laughs> Son, do you need an attitude adjustment? No, sir. I think I can adjust that myself. I appreciate that opportunity, right? Attitudes make a huge difference on our outlook, on our perspective, and on our approach. Now, I haven't used that phrase with our kids, but we have modified it over the years to say this. You can't control the weather but you can always control your attitude. 100% of the time, you have the ability to control that. Paul here, I want us to see why I even bring that up. Paul is writing this simple statement to a church that he loves dearly with an attitude of joy. And that phrase or that word joy is a recurring theme throughout this book. 
We will see it lift up off the page over and over again. And I realize this is a cheesy acronym, but it still works on understanding where joy or what the secret in joy is keeping this proper order. J, Jesus. O, others. Y, yourself. Because we got to consider Paul here, he has the most justifiable reason to have a bad attitude. He is in jail writing this letter. But even in the most dark, dungy, wet, depressing circumstances, he writes with joy because of his attitude. And here's what I need us to see in this search for joy. Please listen carefully. True and lasting joy is found only in Jesus. No Jesus, no joy. No relationship with gospel partners, you're going to lack joy. If you're always focused on yourself, always focused on your stuff, always focused on your problems, always focused on what's next on your calendar, you're going to lack joy. Even believers, God-fearing men and women, sons and daughters of God, it is possible for us to misplace our joy. Let's look at an example in Luke chapter 10. Jesus is walking. You can turn there with me if you'd like, or you can just make a note and read it the story later. Jesus is developing leaders. He's developing his disciples, and he's sending them out for a test pilot run. And he sends out 70 missionaries. Hey, go do X, Y, and Z and report back to me. Good leadership. And so these 70 missionaries come back with joy, saying this in Luke chapter 10, verse 17. Lord, Even the demons submitted to us. They're so excited, like, we got power. But Jesus rebuked them. And he said this in Luke chapter 10, verse 20. Don't rejoice that the spirits submit to you. Rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Where we find our joy and where we place that source of joy matters. Be careful of the temptation to derive our source from joy from our performance, from our popularity, from our giftedness, from our lack accolades or our resources. Instead, rejoice that you have a relationship with God through Jesus and you are not alone. Let that be the underpinning of your joy. And in doing so, the opportunity for us to then focus on Jesus, others, and then yourself. There's a beautiful demonstration of the attitude of gratitude in the way that we live our life that helps us not only frame but maintain a heart of joy. So many times we expect, I've got to achieve perfection And then I will experience joy or then I will show gratitude. But I would suggest look for evidence and look for opportunities to be joyful following Paul's examples in the grace of other people's life. Be quick to thank God for what he's doing in the life of others. Be thankful for the grace and mercy that God is demonstrating in people that you know and love. And be understanding that even in the imperfection of those that you know and love, sanctification is a slow process. That we need to be diligent to pray for the sanctification of others. I selfishly hope that you would pray for the sanctification in me. That we together... Express gratitude and thanks for others and pray for God to move in others. And it just back, let me ask this question for you to internalize and process. Have you expressed thanks to God recently? I hope so. I gave you that opportunity before we started the sermon today to live that out. It was a setup. Okay, Give me an opportunity to practice what we're going to preach. May God help us see this truth. It is only through the work of Christ, because of the blood of Jesus, that I have any value. My sin deserves wrath and separation from God. 
But God, being rich in mercy, has demonstrated his love by sending his son Jesus to me. Wait, may God help us to see that we deserve his wrath, but every good gift that we have comes from him. And therefore, may we not take each other for granted. May we give, be quick to give God thanks for his blessings, and may we be quick to give thanks to God for the people that he has placed in our life. And one sure sign of our spiritual maturity is the demonstration of showing thanks and gratitude to others. Let me, let me say this this way. The gospel will produce in us a joyful attitude of gratitude. Without question, for Paul, thankfulness to God is basic to belonging to Christ. And authentic Christians are marked by an attitude of gratitude. I will enter, this is not in my notes, i got to be careful, I will interject this quickly. I talked about this months and months ago. For those of us in the room that are prone to anxiety and fear, driving and controlling, neuroscience has proven the same brain function that produces fear and anxiety is the same that produces gratitude. And the two cannot physically exist at the same time. Your brain does not have the ability to simultaneously produce gratitude and anxiety. So, perhaps exercising the discipline and action ability of gratitude could reduce the levels of fear and anxiety in you. Just that was for, That's your free counseling session for the day. Point number one, attitude of gratitude in verse three. Point number two, know the joy of prayer. We see this in verse four. Verse four, a reminder says, always in every prayer of mine for you, all making my prayer with joy. The opening verses here are remarkable, especially when you consider the context of the book at large. Paul is praying for his friends in Philippi. He's praying specifically for the church at Philippi, and he is thankful. His mind is overwhelmed and overcome with memories that are a blessing to him. And this leads him to, a, just like we tried to practice earlier, him remembering good leads him to a place of being thankful in the presence. And it is in and through the discipline of prayer that we can commune with God anywhere, anytime. Yes, you can and should pray as we gather as, a, as part of our regular rhythms in worship. We're going to pray together. But you, you can pray when you're not at church. And you should. Pray without ceasing. Always, anywhere, all the time. We're not going to... We spent the entire summer unpacking the themes of prayer and the discipline of prayer. So if you want to learn more about that, go to the website, dive into prayer. We spent weeks and weeks and weeks talking about that. But it is in and through prayer that we gain or regain a fresh perspective where we find strength. Because the very act of prayer is an acknowledgement that we desperately need a source of strength that is outside of us. So the very fact that I'm praying, I'm acknowledging to the authority of the creator and sustainer of the world that I can't do this. I need you. So Paul's reflection here and even Paul's attitude of gratitude was connected for him and should be for us in and through the act and discipline of prayer. And it produced joy because, listen carefully, it was connected to the work of the Spirit. Gratitude and joy are always intertwined in an active and healthy prayer life. Do, do you find this challenging? I do. I find this challenging. Uh, let me just ask some honest question. Do you think that you need something other than Jesus to find real joy? Now, I know what your church answer to that question would be. 
But what do your actions say the answer to that question is? Do you think you need something other than Jesus to find real joy? Man, if my kids would just behave better. If I could just get a better job. If we could just, I would be joyful if we could move into a new house with just a little bit more room. And if I had some more vacation time, then I would find joy. None of those things are bad. But, but are we inadvertently saying that my path to joy is found in those things? This is a trap of an American culture, if I'm really being honest, or if we're willing to be honest with ourselves. Because in American culture, we think bigger is the answer. I need a bigger house. I need a bigger car. I need a bigger bank account. I need bigger muscles. I need a bigger church. But what we really need is a bigger understanding of who God is and how big he is. You have trouble in your life. Yes. But lean into this truth. God is bigger than your trouble. You have successes that make you proud. God is bigger than your successes. And if you have everything but Jesus, you will find yourself longing for more. And if you have nothing but Jesus, you will have everything you need for joyful satisfaction and peace in your life. You see that? In Psalm 42 and 43, we'll not read there. You can take a pen and read these later. This is the the synopsis of those two psalms. We find the psalmist wrestling internally because he's in a season of desperation and despondency. But his response, he begins to preach to himself, saying to his soul, hope in God. He reminds himself, even in spite of his situations, of the goodness of God, the grace of God, The hope that's found in God. And that's what we have to do as well. Maybe we need to start preaching the gospel to ourselves instead of listening to what the world around us says what we need. Maybe we need to do more diligent work to draw near to God as we dwell in his word daily, to not neglect the meeting of the saints together regularly, to to sing songs of praise constantly and all in a spirit of prayer. This is not rocket science. It's actually pretty basic stuff. So I want to go back and just kind of press in a little more closely here out of a conviction that the Lord has given me. I, I try, not just because I'm a preacher, but I've been pursuing Jesus for a long, long time. I try to make sure that my prayer life and the rhythms of my prayer and disciplines of prayer are good. I start every morning with prayer. I pray throughout the day. I hope we all push each other. This is not Ricky being arrogant. But I'll confess, men, I've been listening to my prayers a little more lately. And my prayers, most of the time, are all about me. God, I need you to do this for me. God, I need you to provide this for me. God, I need... And that's not bad. It's not bad. I'm not saying we shouldn't do that. But I'm trying to be more cautious and realize how much of my prayer is just adoring him for who he is. Declaring his faithfulness, his goodness. His sovereignty, His providence. Praise, 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 because you are, and just thinking through His attributes. How much of my prayer should be, in the spirit of Paul, praying for others, interceding for them, thanking God for them. I need to do better at this. And I pray that you would hold me accountable to do that better. To know the joy of prayer and to practice what Paul is saying here, remembering others and praying for them often. Here's the third thing we see. Teamwork makes the dream work. I didn't coin this phrase. I really like it. You've heard it too. But we see this lift off of the page in verse 5. Because, 
Anytime we see that word in Scripture that's connecting to what is just said, okay, we're now seeing the why. Why is he so joyful? Why is he so thankful? Why does he regularly remember them with joy in the attitude of gratitude? Because of your partnership in the gospel from first day until now. I began this morning by sharing a very personal God, I got in the feels a little bit, Astrid, but just sharing with you, like in my own journey and realizing the beauty of the body of Christ in seasons where we need each other the most. Because we partner together in the good and the bad. We don't just partner together in the goals and the things we want to reach and the things we want to do. We partner together for the gospel, for the mission and the, and the reality is a shared mission unites people. A shared mission is the source of fellowship. That principle relates even to non-spiritual things. Like you can go into corporate America and they're going to have a mission statement and they're going to have it because we understand this builds off of really God's design for relationship with us. But the, the most, the, the most transcendent mission is that of the gospel. And when the shared, when the mission is shared and it is the advancement of the gospel, the fellowship then is rooted at the soul level. What I want us to lean into, if we can get technical for just a minute, the word partnership here that we read in verse 5, some of your translations may say fellowship there. Uh, I, I read and study out of the English Standard Version. If you've got a different translation, it may have a different word. Neither of those words are the original word. Okay, They're both trying to concept what the Greek word here is koinonia. That's the word here. And it's repeated oftentimes throughout the New Testament to demonstrate friendship, connection, fellowship, partnership around a mission. So this forces us to slow down and ask a question. If he is thanking them for gospel partnership, we've got to do the work to understand what that means. The word partnership coming from the Greek word koinonia is it appears all throughout Philippians, all throughout the New Testament. We often translate it as fellowship or a variety of relationships that may involve mutual interest or sharing with one another. All of those fall short of the depth of the meaning because it really is about soul-level, gospel-centered friendship that results in shared mission and gospel proclamation. So it's not simple fellowship for the sake of being connected with people. It's community that drives to mission. And it's the two together. Being in community that pushes to mission, which, by the way, fun fact, if you're involved in a life group, there's a reason why we've done the work to make sure that every life group is connected to a mission. Some of you are connected to M2540 doing homeless ministry. Some of you are connected to international friendship ministries. All of those things are very strategic, that we're not just here for fellowship and community, we're not just here for mission. We're here for missional community, gospel partnership, fellowship that drives to gospel advancement. Do you see the difference? So there's two ingredients here in biblical koinonia that we need to lean into and strive to model. Friendship, genuine friendship, and mission. Because we are all made in the image of God, it is possible for a non-believer to have friendship. We're wired for relationships. So this is, we don't have the, the exclusive rights on friendship. This, in fact, from sharing the gospel, the very fact that your non-believing friends desire friendship is the opportunity to take them to the gospel beginning in Genesis 1, how God wired us in his image for relationship. Leverage that to see how God has wired them. Be friends with them. But spiritual friendships, gospel friendships, are uniquely different because they're deeper at the soul level, common, common connections with the gospel. And so it is that common connection of the gospel 
that helps us celebrate together, deal with conflict together, because of the common thread of Jesus. We talked in definition of what the gospel is last week. Go back and check it out if you missed it. But lean into this truth. Everything I want to say today can be summarized this way. How we view the gospel shapes the way we view God's people. If I am viewing people wrongly, I may need to go back and develop a more holistic view of the gospel. And this helps us drive toward mission together. Because the shared mission is gospel proclamation. We see this, we'll see this later in Philippians 1, 27 through 30. We'll see it even further in Philippians chapter 4, verses 14 through 15. As they share together for the sake of the mission. Uh, let, me, let me point this out this way. Through Christ, we are both friends and family and co-laborers. Both together. That's where koinonia, koinonia starts to come in. We've got work to do. Not because we want to be the greatest. No. We've got work to do because our friends, family, neighbors, and loved ones where we live, work, learn, and play are lost and on their way to hell. And we've got the hope to carry to them. we got work to do. We don't, have, we don't have time to complain about paint color. People are dying and going to hell. Does it make sense? And it is that mission that unites us, that gives us clarity. One of my favorite movies, listen to my words carefully, Drake. One of my favorite movies is the trilogy of The Lord of the Rings. Ah, see, I just count all three of them as one. J.R. Tolkien. And in the first, the first part of the movie, The Fellowship of the Ring, if you've watched the movie, if not, if you're into that kind of thing, you'll love it. If you're not, you will hate it. Uh, Tolkien is trying to illustrate some of these things together. And I, I want us to think about who, who comprises the fellowship. I mean, we've got, we've got some hobbits with big hairy feet. We've got some warrior men. We've got a wizard. We've got an elf who is an amazing archer. Uh, we've got some, some dwarf with an axe who's lived underground forever. And it's like, it's the most odd collection of people, right? They're coming from different worlds, different systems. It is like the, the most odd mashup of people. But they come together for this mission to realize we've got to defeat darkness and save Middle Earth. Now, if you know the rest of the story, they are willing to die for the mission. Now, this is allegorical, it's symbolic, but it does demonstrate us as believers. Like if you look at us, we are the most unlikely group of people. Different, different backgrounds, different stories, different shapes, different sizes, different, different cultures fusing together. Some of us, you know, some of us has lived here all of our life. We're natives of Columbus. Some of us are transplants. Some of us are immigrants. Some of us are uh, entrepreneurs. Some of us are blue collar. Some of us are Democrats. Some of us are Republicans. Some of us are libertarian. Some of us are entrepreneurs. Some of us work hourly jobs. Like we're just all over the place. And isn't it beautiful? Because we come together through genuine friendship and family relationship that's rooted in the gospel. And we unite together for a mission that's greater than all of us. To advance the gospel. And I don't know about you. I genuinely can say this. I'll die for it. I will die for the gospel. I pray one day I get to. How awesome would that be? Because it matters that much. Which is why when we talk about our values of, okay, how do we accomplish, well, intentional relationships. We're pursuing Jesus. We're carrying hope. Do you see all, even all of those are woven together in what Paul is saying here. When I reflect on you, man, I thank God for you. 
I remember you with love and with joy and with gratitude. I'm so thankful to God for you, not only for our partnership, not only for our friendship, because we're on mission together, and it's worth it. Can we commit to that together? Let's start by praying. Would you lean into that? Let's pray together. God, we love you, and we thank you for your faithfulness to us, your goodness to us, your provision for us, for dying for our sin, for saving us, for restoring us into a right relationship with you. Thank you, Jesus, for the blood that is applied to my sin. Thank you for the beautiful expression of that love to a dying world that you choose to be your bride, the church. Thank you for inviting us to collectively participate and be the beautiful expression of your bride on this hill, in this city, for this time. And we do not take that lightly. God, may we walk with joy. May we walk with gratitude. May we joyfully communicate that gratitude for one another well. But ultimately, may we have a renewed sense of purpose of gospel advancing mission. And may we spur one another on and hold one another accountable to that. And we'll be careful to give you the praise. In your son's name we pray. Amen.